Hey there, mama, and welcome back to the Moms Overcoming Overwhelm podcast, episode 74. I'm Emily McDermott, and I am here beside you on this journey as we work together to declutter your home, head, and heart. Well, I just got back from a fun trip to Iceland. My husband and I celebrated our 15th wedding anniversary, and we went on a trip. I didn't want to know where we were going, but I did need to know what to pack. So he told me I needed a swimsuit but also hiking shoes and a hat and gloves and a coat. So based upon that, not sure what you would have guessed. I guessed Iceland, but he managed to keep a straight face and not give it away and found out when we got to the airport where we were going, we had a wonderful time. So I hope that you enjoy this last three solo episodes that we've done with the frequently asked questions. You can always feel free to submit those to me at info at simplebyemmy.com or you can go to my website and just go to simplebyemmy.com forward slash podcast, scroll down to where it says leave a recording and you can go ahead and maybe be on the show and be featured. And today, before we jump into our conversation with Katie Keene, I just want to say thank you for all your support. I just recently hit the top 1% globally of all podcasts, which is amazing, and got some new reviews from Apple Podcasts. I wanted to share one. This is from Deplorable Mama Bear. I love these iTunes names. They're the best. (laughs) A consistent favorite. Emily's podcast is a personal favorite, and I routinely look forward to each new episode. Her content is relevant and truly resonates with my own experience of motherhood. Her tips are practical and her podcast is concise and professional. I truly feel like I have a helpful, kind, and knowledgeable friend alongside me in my own personal journey to simplify my own life, to make more room for the things that truly matter. Well, thank you so much. And again, appreciate your support. If you would like to leave a review for the show, just go ahead, head over to Apple Podcasts, find the podcast and scroll down to where it says write a review in very small purple letters. It means the world to me and it helps the podcast to grow. So we're going to go ahead and dive into our conversation with my friend Katie Keene. Katie is the host of the also top 1% globally ranked podcast, (laughs) Her Home and Heart. And she's also host to a membership community of beautiful Christian homeschooling families on the journey to peace at home and generational family success despite the challenges of raising a special needs child. Her mission is very simple, to ensure that no family breaks apart simply due to lack of tools to create a solid, peaceful, and joyful family foundation at home. And today we're talking about the systems that she's implemented, how she's leveraged the power of habit stacking. And if you've been here for any length of time, you know how much I love habits and habit stacking. And we're talking about the importance of having flexible systems to allow you to overcome the overwhelm that comes with parenting, but also in her case, parenting several children with special needs. So what do you say? Grab the notebook and pen and let's dive into today's conversation with Katie Keene. Hey there, mama. Are you tired of all the stuff crowding your home calendar and mind? Do you wish you could say goodbye to the endless to-do list running around in your head? Want to declutter but don't know where to start? You're in the right place. Welcome to Mom's Overcoming Overwhelm, where you will find proven and practical solutions to declutter your home, head, and heart. Hi, I'm Emily, a wife, boy mom, and simplicity seeker. I struggled to get pregnant and felt overwhelmed until I discovered decluttering could create the physical and emotional space I needed to become a mom. Now two kids later, I've transformed my life and motherhood by developing simple systems around decluttering, capsule wardrobes, kid stuff, cleaning and tidying, meal planning, time management, and more, and I can't wait to share them with you. If you're ready to reclaim the time and energy you crave, be present with your kids, and finally enjoy the life and motherhood you so deserve, let's kick overwhelm to the curb, shall we? Grab your lukewarm coffee, your notebook and pen, and clear off some counter space. Let's do this. Well, hi, Katie. Thank you so much for coming on the Moms Overcoming Overwhelm podcast. I am thrilled to talk to you today. Yes, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. So you and I connected through our podcast, Mastermind. I always feel like cool when I say mastermind. <laughs> like I have a mind that could be mastering something, <laughs> which I don't feel like most of the time. But um, you have such a 
I don't know, a servant's heart, I would say. I just really love everything that you have contributed to our meetings there. And then just also as a person, you have such a compelling story and mission and your heart for moms is just amazing, which is one reason why I wanted you on the show. So I was hoping you could just introduce yourself a little bit, you know, you, your family, kind of who you serve. And then when you're not doing all of those things, anything you might like to do for fun, if that's possible. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, Well, so I am a former Navy child. So I was a military brat. I swore I was never moving again and promptly met my amazing military husband. So I spent all of my adult life and childhood moving around the world. And I literally fell in love with people. I love people. And um, throughout, you know, my married life, we have had five kids and that has been really fun. And God has brought us to a place where we homeschool. We both came from public school families, love teachers with all of our hearts, had no idea we'd be led to homeschooling, but we were, and it has been the most fantastic journey that I could have ever imagined. And it has been a gift. I know God led us to that because we have kids inside of our, our family. A couple of the kids have special needs. So one of my passions for serving families is not just the homeschooling side. That is one of my absolute passions, but also even more um, special, you know, families who homeschool who also have a special needs child, because that life is something that's so different than I expected. And then, you know, every parent I've spoken to who's been thrust into this unexpected life will tell you like, we just what now, you know, get these diagnoses and you don't know what to do. There's no manual. So anyway, um, I really, I love serving homeschool families and then families who have special kids like I do. Yeah. And I feel like, and we'll get into your story a little bit here, but, um, you have children that have some significant needs and then also that impacts how you run your home, what the environment looks like in your home the way that you structure your schedule and the things that are easier to do and maybe harder to do. I don't want to say can and can't do, but just more easier and harder. And I think that kind of what we talk about here, as far as sort of decluttering your home head and heart, a lot of it has to do with how are we setting up our homes to best support us with our specific needs and requirements for these humans that are living in it. And I feel like you um, know a lot about that. (laughs) Certainly had to go through the paces of learning. Yes. How to keep it together in the middle of a lot of trial and stress and unexpected things thrown our way and to do it while still glorifying God. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I want to take you back to a time and that can be any time. It could be today. It could be (laughs) five years ago, 10 years ago when you really felt just completely overwhelmed, you knew something needed to change. And this could be in your physical space. It could be with your systems and routines, um, your habits, some of these things that I know that you like to talk about, we're going to talk about today, but really any of it where you were kind of, you know, raising that white flag, praying to God, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. I need help. And sort of how you got yourself out of that to kind of overcome that overwhelm. Can you share a story with us, please? Absolutely. I'll try to keep it concise. (laughs) And first I want to just preface everything I say with, this was all the work of God. He was leading me. Even the homeschooling was actually leading us into being able to have systems in our home that helped us survive where statistically we shouldn't have been able to survive. If you look at the statistics on families with as many diagnoses as we have, then we should be divorced. The children should all be bitter and it should be a disaster. But instead God met us in the middle (laughs) The very messy middle. And he, he gave us these tools. We didn't even realize that he was shaping in our home that allowed us to have systems, very flexible systems to survive through these things and to almost like a, a life raft, you know, as we went along. So, um, you know, I, okay, let me see, let me try to just pick out one story because I have millions, but through the years, through homeschooling and through my firstborn having had a stroke, I learned as he sat at the table in second grade, crying, just these hot tears streaming down his face, looking at this math workbook. I had the kids on the floor next to me. <laughs> you know, it was just the house is a mess. And I remember seeing his little childish writing inside the, the workbook and it said, I hate math. And I was like, oh boy, I was already fine tuned to paying attention to him because I knew that 
he had already had the stroke. He was doing really well. This was a stroke at birth. So we had been a couple of years into really watching him, but I knew there could always be something, always be on the lookout. So in that moment, as he's sitting there and I'm like, oh, this isn't what I want for my family. You know, we've chosen homeschool, so it could be better because this is what we've been led to knowing we need to do, but it's not going to be like this with distress and misery. So in that moment, I actually took what was a structure of curriculum and my soul like yelled, enough, <laughs> we are done. And I actually had to undo a structure, kind of strange, but in undoing a structure of a curriculum and a very set path of what looked like school over where I went to school, for example, in public schools, by undoing that, God was in, in allowing us to open the doors to make room for a better structure. We ended up with a lot of flexibility in how we taught him and really looking at him as a whole person and looking at what led him to joy in learning and not just in learning school subjects, but learning in general in life. And that set up the stage for us to be able, because he did by the end of the year, end up back in that workbook, he, um, which was fine if he hadn't, but he just happened to, and he had a little heart in the back by the end of the year oh. inside of it, which was really cute, you know, and um, it set the stage though, for us to be able to survive because I learned flexibility some serious diagnoses with our daughter and far more serious diagnoses with my son who currently has not overcome his diagnoses. And we live in a high level of stress regularly with his, his medical care. But because we had undoing of certain structures, God implemented others and let us thrive through them. So it is real interesting how flexible we need to be in our life. Yeah, that's, I'm just thinking about how for me as a person, when I am faced with the unknown, my first reaction is to try to control the environment, yes. you know? So I think that's pretty normal, pretty human. And the thought of like, okay, I'm going to get the system together. Okay. It's working. We're okay. We're surviving. And then that moment, like you said, when you realize like, no, this isn't working anymore. Like this isn't serving me. It's kind of scary because yes. then you're like, whoa, what does undoing look like. And yeah. I think a lot of times we stay stuck in the same patterns or systems because we're kind of scared about what would it look like if I had to change something. Yeah. And I just really applaud you because obviously that was a very overwhelming time for you. And a lot of times when we're in that survival mode, we're like, okay, well, this isn't great, but I can get through, like I can just keep getting through, but you knew it wasn't really serving you, it wasn't serving your child. It wasn't just serving your, your life. So I think that's a good testament to looking at what is actually working, what isn't working, and then having that courage to discern, pray, whatever the case may be to say, okay, yeah, something needs to change. So what does that need to be? So that's, wow, that's a really amazing story. And I guess if you're having an overwhelmed mom and they're like, okay, there's just too much going on. Like this is chaos. This is craziness. And I don't have any systems, let alone any systems to undo, <laughs> you know, where do you start? And like, where did you start being able to create those flexible systems that have served you throughout all of these seasons of motherhood and all of these diagnoses and difficulties? Like where would you recommend someone starting and what did you have to do kind of out of necessity? to start that? Well, I'll, I'll say that I was led to people in a way very similar to you with what you're doing with home organization. And I just started searching for other people who are ahead of me in the areas where I knew I needed something different. I just didn't know what it was I needed. And I, and God brought me the people. He brought me the, I don't know, the, the systems, the tools in little tiny pieces so that I could digest what I needed. And, you know, not, not all of them were perfect. They weren't all that, the exact system, but it all led to a little, another, like another step, a little step and a little step and a little step. <laughs> and that was all I could handle at the time anyway. And so I would say for a mom who really doesn't have any systems in place, you know, go looking for the Emily's that are out there, you know, depending on what your exact circumstances, if you're a homeschool mom with a special needs kid, I'm here. You know, there are, there are those of us who are, are ahead that are called to serve those who are just getting started. And that's a beautiful place to just get the support you need. Yeah, I agree with that. And just remembering that it's okay that the person, the person only needs to be a couple steps ahead of you. <laughs> 
I have to remind myself of that constantly because I want to be go from the A to the Z and I'm like, wait, you just want me to go from A to B? Like that doesn't seem like that matters. But it does matter because like you said, and I'm going to be talking about this, I think on your podcast, this concept of capacity is huge in my life, which is that I have to understand what my capacity is right now to be able to make these changes. And it doesn't have to be this perfectionist all or nothing mentality. It really is what is like kind of the small tweak that I can do to have things be like that 1% better than it was yesterday. And go ahead. You look like you're like, oh, yes, oh, you, show you me. Just said it. Yes. 1% better. It has to be tiny little steps if we want it to be sustainable. And if we want it to be life-changing, we always think these life-changing steps need to be these massive things, these two leaps, these overnight transformations, but that is completely wrong. That is the way you will burn out and feel like a failure. Cause I know, why do I know? Because I've done it over and over. It's those tiny little 1% shifts. Exactly. Like you said. Yeah. And I think that this concept of habit stacking, which you and I talked about you, and I'd like you to go into this specific example. If you could, you were talking about your one son who was having this very intense neurodiversity therapy and you were having to be able to manage your home and do all this and then have that kind of on top of everything else. But you were able to use this concept of habit stacking, which you can define if you would like. But again, that is really that incremental, like, okay, we're going to be able to add this to this, try that out, test it, then try something else. So can you talk specifically about what you did when he was going through that intense therapy? Sure. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll give a little glimpse of what that looked like. So he was five, all the therapies we had done prior had not worked. We had done all of them that we could find. He is profoundly disabled. He has an uncontrollable seizure condition that he still has to this day, nonverbal, but mobile. And so he's, he's like having a baby, a very active baby all the time. So not only did we have his full-time care needs, but we were homeschooling. And at this point, of course, I have five children and we also started this 90 hour week every single day. So it was seven days a week from the minute he woke up to the minute he went to sleep where we were intentionally providing him with therapy. We went to a neurodevelopmental institute and got trained how to do this. We would send reports that were like mini novels every couple months, you know, and they would help us track his development. So to survive that, basically these systems that God had given us over time in tiny little 1% shifts, right? By reaching out and learning from other people, those allowed me to learn to tie in anything important that I have to do with something I'm already doing. So for me, things like brushing my teeth, if I was going to brush my teeth, then that was a trigger to remind me of maybe the medicine I needed to give him that morning, some of his supplements, you know, or, you know, just look at your own day, but, you know, eating lunch, eating dinner, there's always going to be something you're going to do no matter what, absolutely going to do. You're not going to skip it. Even going to the bathroom can become a useful thing to tie because we have these stable pieces in our day, no matter how out of control our day may feel. And when we reassess what we need to be like accomplishing in a day, First, I had a mentor say to me, it's like filling a a vase. And first you put in the big rocks, then you put in the little rocks, then you put in the sand and the big rocks are the most important. So you go and assess what your big rocks are and you tie those things to those non-negotiables during your day. You are going to eat. You are going to use the bathroom. You are going to wake up and you are going to go to sleep. You are going hopefully to brush your teeth. (laughs) You know, And so if you tie any of your big rocks to those items, even if it's through, it could be simple, like putting a sticky note on the mirror, you know, any set an alarm in your phone, like whatever it takes for you specifically. And it can look different for everybody, but to remember to do those things until they become habit. Once they become habit and they will, I promise, then you layer in the next things and it's got to be little by little. And before long, you will be accomplishing so much that you absolutely can't believe the progress But when you do it little by little, you don't feel that excessive strain that will break you down and stop you. Instead, you can actually keep adding in. I hope that's a good explanation. It is. It totally is. And I'm a habits geek, so I love the habit stacking stuff, but I never thought about the bathroom one. I'm like, yes, totally. Because I think about those as being like anchor 
events, like you said, things that are happening every day, no matter what, you know, you're going to be eating, you're going to be sleeping, hopefully (laughs) using the bathroom, brushing your teeth, and then being able to stack this on top. But I think what is really interesting, very powerful about that specific example is that when you're talking about these big rocks, you already had kind of big rocks in your life, in your family. Then you had this humongous 90 hour a week boulder that's just like thrown in there. (laughs) And then all of a sudden that becomes the biggest rock and then you're having to shift things around it. So was there kind of like a huge like adjustment period knowing that, okay, this huge amount of time is now going to be our reality for this foreseeable future and how I didn't prep you for this. So heads up, (laughs) but like the flexible, yeah, right. The flexible systems that you were able to create and had that foundation, how are those able to serve you when you had Mm -hmm. this big amount of time that was like literally dropped in your lap as like, no, this is the most important thing. Like, how did you adjust to that? Okay. So let me start with the first part of your question. Like, what did we do in order to create, to make that 90 hour, our big rock? I did certain things like I hired some cleaning girls and we didn't have much to put into that. So I actually spoke to a company and said, what would it take to just do my bathrooms in my kitchen? And I love that. Yeah. And so that was great because that also spurred the rest of the family to remain focused and motivated on that morning before the cleaning girls came. And that allowed us to basically compress our cleaning schedule in our home. I also just had to reprioritize what was the most important and what was a nice to have. And I just personally had to allow a little more clutter. I know that's not fun. That is not where we want to stay, but that was for that season. And I had to say, okay, we're going to do certain chores maybe instead of every week or twice a week, maybe it could be done every other week. We'll see, you know, we weren't living in squalor. We just had to adjust for our sanity and it was for that time. And so we ended up, of course, not being able to have the cleaning girls once COVID hit. (laughs) And I was, I got very, very sick for those first few months because I burned out. I had neglected rest. I had, I had looked at all my children very holistically from a mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical perspective. But for myself, I would joke that I would rest enough and sleep enough when I died. That's not a good motto. Don't do that. I really recommend you do not do that. Let something else go, not your health. But what we discovered was these systems we had put into place that carried us through this time, through the 90 hour a week time, and also through the time when I was very sick and my family had to run the home basically by themselves with me just overseeing was we had worked on that holistic well-being. So we already had had tight bonds. We already had been able to know like what did the kids need physically so we knew how to support their emotions love languages for example we knew how to support you know their physical bodies who had allergies and all that kind of stuff so we thankfully over a long period of time very slowly through lots of baby steps had addressed those issues so that was good the second one that we had was family dynamics that's a huge piece when you're a family under stress experiencing a lot of extra stuff in life. And that could come from a lot of reasons. It doesn't have to just be special needs, but knowing how to talk to each other efficiently, effectively, and in a systemized way, because high emotions can really interfere with clear communication. And so we had created systems in our home through a family government. That's where we have pre-decided what everyone is going to do in our home, similar to how we live in a government in our country. It was no different, you know, but we just applied it to our smaller home. So everybody knew what was going to happen. I didn't have to always tell everyone the rules. We could go to the front door and I could point and say, what did our family agree we were going to live by, you know, in the middle of a conflict, for example, we also had systemized conflict resolution. We literally have a system of when we have a conflict, how is it solved? So that I'm like super stressed because believe me, there are a lot of opportunities in a homeschool life with lots of little kids, tons of allergies, and you're doing an idea hour a week program. Mom can get super stressed. Well, that can come out like yelling that can come out like physical anxiety and pain. And I didn't want to live like that. We couldn't have lived like that, especially in a program where neurodevelopmentally you have to be joyful if you really want it to work. So We ended up needing to have systems for conflict and a system that not just helped me shepherd the children, but helped me. It was my safety net so that I wasn't making decisions on the fly in those high intense moments where I'm feeling horrible. I'm sick and tired of the sixth fight for the day. I just want everyone to be quiet so that I can feel better. 
And, you know, every mom, I think, has gotten to that point. You get that whispering in your head where it's like, oh, you're failing as a mom. You know, you're look how badly you're raising these kids. They won't quit fighting, right? We all get whatever those thoughts are. But when you have a system set up for yourself that says, mom, here's what you do. You go to the door. Kids, what does the door say? How are we going to live by? Okay, you're conflicting. Well, let's practice this. I mean, you can't have good conflict resolution skills without conflict. So mm-hmm. it can be viewed as a blessing to be very honest, but you have these opportunities to teach them how to walk through conflict in your home when they're young, because this co- equips them for adulthood. And when you've systemized that, then you can actually look at it as a gift instead of as an interruption and interference. Mm-hmm. So that was super, super helpful for us. And then the last one was just education and discipleship. We had through my son and then my daughter prior to this 90 hour a week program already really worked on looking at the children, like I mentioned, as a whole person and throwing out whatever didn't work for them and looking at keeping their self-confidence intact because that mattered more than anything we ever tried to teach them because they now as they're, I mean, once 19, once 17, they have the self-confidence that they need to go teach themselves anything they want to. And all I had to do for high school was partner with them and support them. They self-directed high school and very Uh well, might I add, even my daughter with significant learning disabilities. So you know, it's, it's nice when you have created a little, a little imperfectly done system to get you through those really hard things in life. Yeah. Well, I'm completely blown away (laughs) and I'm going to have you back on the show. You can be one of my first repeat guests because I want to dive into in another conversation about those family systems, because I only have the two kids and there is a lot of conflict going on in this house. And I would love to have, yeah, just some of those, like you realize that you're teaching that skill, like you said, of conflict resolution, which is like really, really key. So yes, everyone stay tuned because Katie is going to be back. So I'd love to just wrap up and and first of all, thank you, because I feel like this is really helpful understanding that when people are faced with these challenges that might seem kind of insurmountable and then being able to manage their homes and also care for their families that you can have these significant challenges and you're able to have those, like you said, the, you know, the 1% changes and both Katie and I are here to support you in that if you need a cheerleader or coach in that regard. But can you tell us a little bit more about where everyone can connect with you and yeah, just everything you have going on so we can find out more. Absolutely. Well, the most fun place to connect with me because I change things out there all the time is actually a very simple little link tree page. <laughs> I don't know if your listeners have heard of link tree, but it's literally link and then tr.ee and then slash family success. So find me there because I'm always popping in new coupons and new things that are happening. Um, but you can find me on Instagram um, at Katie Keen 20. And I also have her home and heart.net. I have quite a few different places there slash TGH for the greater honor. If you're a special needs family for this membership that I'm launching, that is to support the family around the special needs kids. That's the first place to find me, but go to my, my family success link tree because all the goodies are there. That's the most. Okay. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, I will go ahead and link to that. And yeah, I had not been aware of link tree. So I'll have to look at that for myself. I when, love it. I not to promo it because I mean I'm just get the free version, but man, it's so fun. <laughs> yeah, good to know. Good to know. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Katie. It's been really, really fun. And I know my listeners are going to gain so much from listening to this conversation. So thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Emily. If you like today's podcast, here's what you can do. Just take 30 seconds to leave me a review. I know you're a busy mama. You're overwhelmed, in fact, but 30 seconds of your day makes such an impact. I'll be blessed by your words. They'll definitely make my day. And who knows, you might be entered for this month's giveaway. An Apple podcast, scroll down to write a review. Thanks so much for your time. I'm so grateful for you.